Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 371, featuring part three of my interview with Major David Wesley. In this part of the interview, we talk about his games for the ColecoVision. He's also got some uh, great stories about the creation of the uh, ColecoVision console, some of the problems they encountered and how they uh, overcame those. Uh, we also talk about uh, one of the best games uh, for that system, the Zaxxon. It's a great port, the arcade classic. And he's got a lot of uh, great details here about the development of that game. And again, uh, overcoming some really uh, in incredible challenges to make that uh, game a reality. And uh, we wrap up with a little uh, discussion about a, a certain uh, smurf et uh, incident, a porno smurf incident, if you will. That's a, a pretty harrowing story, I suppose, if you're looking at that from a, a business point of view. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is David Wesley. Yeah, so let, let's move into uh, the Coleco then. And I know you, you worked on, what, Zaxxon and uh, Spy Hunter and a few other titles for that platform? Yeah, yeah, we did. Well, David Arneson was a uh, part of our group, but he was looking for greener pastures. He was not a programmer. And while it was fun to have him around and on the payroll, we totally blew the opportunity to take huge advantage of his presence by having the new computer dungeon adventure by David Arneson, co-author of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, on, on everything we wrote, which would have been enormously good marketing. Um, he gave us some stuff. He worked on a couple of our game projects. He worked on the Battle of Britain game that we did. But um, he sent a chance to go and get a job at Coleco Industries. Now, Coleco was the Connecticut leather company that had branched out into toys like backyard dart sets that'll kill you dead <laughs> as a doornail um, and other stuff over the years. And they had now decided, they had a vice president named Eric Bromley who had convinced them they should go into the video game business. And they were working on the ColecoVision video game, which is going to be the great leap forward, a way past all the other video game systems you could pong and such that you could buy from other mm -hmm. people. So you have color graphics, you can have really neat games. And Bromley went to Japan where there was this profusion of arcade games coming out. And he went around to see what were the big sellers because he was sure that they would appeal to our teenagers just like the Japanese ones. And the Japanese companies who made the video games were starting to penetrate the U.S. market with them. So he went around, he found the best, hottest items in Japan, he went to the companies and he got the rights to replicate those games on the ColecoVision. You couldn't just download them because those games, these game units cost $10,000 a piece and they had two of the top of the line Motorola 68000 or 6810 chips in them. They were, um, I should say 68010, but in any case, um, they were high tech stuff. And he was going to turn it onto a home unit that would sell for 150 bucks and have one little Z80 in it and some kind of a dedicated graphics chip. And that was just orders of magnitude dumber. So all you could do was to get a Coleco, it was for Coleco to buy a $10,000 arcade machine, set it up along with a bunch of others in a room in their headquarters and have volunteers play the games all day long while other people videotaped them while they played. And you figured out what all the features were and where the Easter eggs were and everything else that you could find on those games by playing them a lot. And then you'd write up a script as to how the game is supposed to work and you'd hand it to somebody and he'd just, have to just write a program to make it run on your dumb little machine. Well, they needed play testers to do these playing and playing and playing and making notes. And Dave Arneson, the co-author of Dungeons and Dragons, is available. So Mr. Arneson got a job out there and he is working on stuff. And he is listening to what's going on around him and he hears that they have some significant engineering problems that they're working with and getting the ColecoVision actually ready to sell. It's still not running right. So he casually suggests that he knows this guy in Minnesota named Dan Nicholson who's like really sharp and he could probably help them. So on his recommendation, they let Dan come out there. And they, before he went out, they asked Dan, well, what would you expect to get paid? And Dan said, well, $100 an hour. At that point, we are in bad financial position. So this took a lot of guts to go there, right? Dan says, $100 an hour. And they said, $100 an hour? He said, yeah, well, I am the principal architect on the IBM System 3, you know. This is, I'm one of the top programmers in America, right? I go, oh, well. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do you deal. I'll come out there and work for you 
for three weeks for $50 an hour. And at the end of that time, you either give me $100 an hour or I go home. Okay, we'll try you out. So he goes out there. First day he arrives, Eric Bromley, the vice president, who's in charge of this whole operation, has him in, says, hello, Mr. Nicholson, it's really hot stuff. And he gets the head of the programming department in and he introduces them and sends him downstairs. Programming department head takes him down to a big staff meeting that's going on where they are discussing the problems they have with their operating system and how intractable they are and how we ever need to get this fixed. After about a half an hour of Dan sitting in there, the program director turns to him and says, so what do you think about this? And Dan says, I think I can fix that problem for you. Everybody in the room takes suction there and says, oh yeah? No, brash new guy, right? And he said, how long will he think? You think about three days. And they all said, okay, fine, Nicholson works on that for the next three days. Let's talk about the next problem, right? Shortly thereafter, in comes the vice president, Mr. Bromley. He comes in, he says, oh, I guess you guys all met Nicholson now. Yeah, yeah, we have. We've been telling him about the problems we got on the system. And he says, you're going to fix it in three days. And um, Bromley says, um, he has signed a non-disclosure agreement, hasn't he? Uh, no, I thought you did that before you gave it to me. What? So now they've breached security, something awful. Fortunately for them, Dan is a real straight arrow. He doesn't say, well, that'll be $200 an hour. <laughs> no, he just said, oh, no, I'll happy to sign him and give me one of those, right? So he gets that taken care of. Everybody's a little more happy. And then three days later, he solved their problem on their operating system, oh. and they're off and running. Um, and that really settled that question. So the next thing Bromley said to him was, are there any more like you out in Minnesota? And Dan happily said, oh, yes, we have some more guys in the company that could come out here. So, so I and two of the other guys in the company, or three of the, no, I and two of the other guys in the company went out and went to work at Coleco along with Dan. Now they had the Zaxxon game, which was a wonderful game, and it was highly popular in Japan, mm -hmm. but it embodies something that was a brand new idea at the time. All the games up to then, you either went up the screen, I mean, the screen scrolls from top to bottom very fast, so you're driving your car up the road or something, or you went from side to side across the screen, and the screen scrolls from right to left very fast with your stationary or moving up and down little airplane bombing and strafing things, right? That's sort of a layout of games, right? Zaxxon scrolled diagonally. Now, that might not seem like much, but they were doing this, this mock 3D, this isometric presentation, where you can get a feel for three-dimensional view of what you're doing as you fly diagonally up the countryside, or rather your plane moves up and down here and changing altitude, and the world moves diagonally past you. Um, this game was showed to the engineers after Bromley came back just all agog at the thought that he had the most fabulous game in all of Japan, and he got the rights to it. And the engineers looked at it and said, that's impossible, we can't do that because you have to move so much data and copy it for new locations over and over again as you scroll the screen down, that that diagonal scrolling is just going to be impossible to do. We can't do that. It, it's in, in, it'll never be done. And they turned him down, and he's really disappointed because that was going to be a big winner for them. That was the game they wanted to make the feature game of the new system, right? So here's Miracle Worker Nicholson, who, well, and his team. So they assigned us all to do Zaxxon. And the people who were still somewhat green with envy relative to Dan in the programming department doubtless chuckled up their sleeves and gave them that one. That'll take care of those guys, right? So Dan got the working on it. He was sure he could figure out how to do it. And we got to handle all the details. There's a million and one details in any graphically intended video game. And so we discovered right away that Eric Bromley was a feature creep guy. He was a micromanager. He would appear at your elbow at 2 o'clock in the morning and ask you what you were working on. We were working 14 hours a day. It was just a killer schedule, day, day, seven days a week, you know, to get this thing done on time. But there he'd pop up out of no place and ask you questions and suggest changes that would then come down in a memo the next day and change how things are supposed to work after you got them working the other way first. Then, you know, Drive you nuts. Well, we discovered Dan was never going to get any work done that way. So we didn't quite tell the truth to Eric. We told him that David McGarry was the president of our company, actually. And, our, and, and, and Nicholson was just, you know, the hotshot programmer. So being a hierarchical kind of guy, 
Bromley largely confined himself to going to McGarry and telling him what he wanted and asking him the questions and not bugging Dan, which was good. Mm. After a couple of weeks in ivory tower isolation, Dan came back and demonstrated how the diagonal scrolling could be made to work. And after that fundamental detail was taken care of, then all the rest of the stuff worked pretty well. We had lots and lots of tweaky little things to do. But late in the project, the, the, the games are sold on cartridges. The cartridge would contain the, uh, the Z80, well, the Z80 chip is, I'm sorry, is in, the, is in the base unit. But the cartridge contains memory chips, mm -hmm. RAM, chi uh, 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 ROM chips that have been, that have been uh, cut, made at the factory and they have all the stuff on it. For testing purposes, we had EE proms which could be uh, electrically erased problems and then reprogrammed. And we had them connected to a system. We'd write our code in Pascal, which would then be compiled. And the compiled code would then be burned into the chipset in the cartridge. And then put the cartridge into a, into a ColecoVision unit that was already semi-assembled. And then you'd play that. And glitches would occur. You'd have some people would work out where the problems were in the machine or in the cartridge, and you'd fix them and you'd go again. And so different ideas we had for the way the graphics were looking at everything went after you burned in, brought over, plugged in, tried, pulled out, put on the pile of reprogrammable cartridges, new one burned, you know, it, it's tedious. But mm -hmm. so we're going through this cycle to do all the work. And they've established that the maximum memory size in the cartridge is going to be 32K of available RAM. Or, or E prom, sorry, ROM on the final ones, right? And then somebody decided they'd make them too expensive and there wouldn't be enough profit margin. So uh, late in the project, they abruptly decided they're going to cut it down to 24, not 32. Wow. So we got to get rid of 8K of memory in a game that is packed, bulging into what's in there. So we looked at it, and we went about, and we did something very much of the period. We knew that compilers weren't terribly efficient. So we took the compiled code, we ran it through a disassembler and turned it into a lawfully lot of assembly language instructions. And then we walked our way through the assembly language and we changed two-byte operations into one-byte operations. And so things that used to be um, absolute addresses, they would you know, jump to two-byte hex address for the next step. You'd check, and if it was less than 128 bytes away, you'd turn into one byte one that said jump relative forward by 124 bytes, or whatever it would work out to be. This is not portable code. I mean, everything is now tweaked and packed. And, but by doing this, you managed to get all the functionality after a few days of mind-numbing exercise and going back and fixing mistakes. We managed to get it all packed down into the available space on the cartridge, and they got away with only 16K of memory on the cartridge. So that was, we were heroes, right? We saved them still more money. Um, when the game was finally finished, everyone was awestruck. And the game was hot stuff, and it was going to be the one you fielded with the game when it sold, right? And they were really happy because that was a heck of a marketing thing for them. You buy the game and you get this, you buy the, buy the, the ColecoVision and you get this cool, super duper game in it. Um, a lot of places I can go with this here. Maybe I should just back up a second and let you, let you ask a question because that gets me to the point where we've, we've finished <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to work in here, uh, another game, Pretty well-known game for the ColecoVision, yeah. the Smurf game. Okay. And you've got a story about that I'd never heard before about Porno Smurf. Porno Smurf, <laughs> yes. Um, that was okay. The Smurf game is a real nice game for kids, mm, sure. right? No blowing things up, no killing people. Your poor little Smurf, why moves from left to right across? Or actually, the poor little Smurf stands there on the screen. And the screen scrolls the other way. And he can go forward or he can go back when you hit the buttons. He jumps forward or back. He can jump up in the air. He can crouch down. And he can jump forward and up or backward and up, things like that. And as he goes through trying to rescue the Smurfette who has been imprisoned by Gargamel, the evil wizard, he walks through caverns where he has to be very careful when he jumps to immediately duck so he doesn't hit it on a dangling stalactite. He doesn't impale himself on an upthrusting stalagmite. He doesn't fall down a chasm. He jumps across things. You know, he, 
hippity hoppity work your way through kind of game and from time to time these evil crows that are sent out by Gargamel to stop him swoop down and attack him and he has to duck in time not to be hit okay so you got these this little thing he goes through and it's it's a maneuvering game and the kids can have fun and it plays happy little bouncy music at the end when he gets into the laboratory in Gargamel's castle he hops from this to that to the other thing and he climbs himself back and forth till he gets up to the top level where the Smurfette is locked up in a cage Along the way, he has found the key which he is carrying with him. He now puts, he now steps up, and the key, a little arm with the key, sticks out into the lock and twists it, and the gate falls off the cage. And she's there, and she goes, wee, and steps forward and kisses him. End of happy game, okay? Now, there's a property on the machine. Well, I'll, I'll do this in the other order. They, they had a bunch of these cartridges, prototype cartridges were prepared. We're getting close to the release date and various people in the hierarchy of the company have children. And so they, they had prototype ColecoVisions at home. They were trying stuff on already. And here comes the new Smurf game. So everybody, the little kids, gets a Smurf game to take home. These are handmade Smurf games. So I don't know, you know, $1,000 a piece probably. But in any case, they take them home. And one of the guy's little daughters is out there playing the game and having a fun time. And she starts laughing and laughing. And he says, oh, do you like it? Oh, it's so funny. You've got to see this, Daddy. So he goes in and looks. Now, if when the bars fall down and the Smurfette raises her hands in joy, you hit the duck button for the Smurf. No reason why you'd do that. But you hit the button and makes him duck. As his head comes down, her dress vanishes. The symbolism is kind of spooky, okay? Mm -hmm. And the little girl thought it was so funny that her dress vanishes like that. Oh, she's all naked underneath it, right? And there's no detail. She's just a little blue body. But in any case, mm -hmm. um, this was panic city time. The, <laughs> the VP or whoever has got the thing immediately calls Eric Bromley in the middle of the night and says, Eric, Eric, you've got a porno game here, right? And all the handmade copies are immediately seized and brought back for destruction. And much, much beating of the bushes goes on about, was this an act of sabotage by some disgruntled programmer? And the actor was, no, it was an inadvertent interaction because you generated the images. The background is a, is a background plane. And then there before, in front of that, there are successive planes in which you can operate what are called sprites. These are little rectangular things, like 16 pixels on a side. And the Smurf and the Smurfette, who have to move against that background, are made up of sprites. And there was a property in the way that the graphic system worked called the fifth sprite problem. If you have four sprites on the same horizontal row in the screen, mm -hmm. I keep making gestures to you, and they're all they're seeing is the end on, right? Hi. In the same horizontal row on the screen, um, the four highest priority sprites will be displayed, but everything with a lower priority than that will vanish. And each sprite can only be one color. So the Smurf's blue body and red hat and I remember when he was white, I think, uh, smock and uh, so on is one uh, a set of sprites that are all printed on top of each other and stay in one place and move with him as a unit. Over to the right, we have the Smurfette, who has a blue body and a white dress and I don't know what else, but in any case, shoes probably, right? And they're all sprites. When the Smurf steps up alongside her, parallel to her on the screen, they are all on the same horizontal row. We have exactly four sprites that are perfectly lined up with each other, and all the others are carefully engineered to not quite overlap each other so that although there are four sprites in the Smurf, they aren't four sprites all printed one on top of the other. Some of them are printed lower, some are printed higher, like his hat, for example. So the number that are actually in line horizontally are only four. When he ducks down, his hat comes down, and it is a higher priority than her dress. So her dress vanishes. And this was um, it was um, alarming, shall we say. <laughs> so a lot of work was done in a big hurry to rearrange sprite priorities so that when he ducks down, if some player actually hits the duck button right then, his hat has a lower priority than her dress, so he takes his hat off to her. 
Isn't that swift? <laughs> Anyhow, um, but that was, the, that was the kind of little minutia stuff we were doing on doing these games. And they were certainly fun mm -hmm. to go through. Now, the summer after, ColecoVision comes out for Christmas. And we work across the summer. And then we go back to Minnesota to work on, work remotely for Coleco with games that were working on for them in Minnesota and communicating not by email in those days, of course, but by regular mail with tape cartridges being mailed back and forth between us, which is not a real fast turnaround. But anyhow, we're doing that. The next spring, we come to Gen Con, actually the next summer, we come to Gen Con. And by now, ColecoVisions have been out on the market for nine months, or no, not, and have been out on the market for six months, right? I arrive at Gen Con, I'm walking through, and there's Mike Stackpole at the Flying mm -hmm. Buffalo booth, and a huge crowd out in front of it. And he has a TV set up in there, and he has a ColecoVision hitch to it. And he says, Dave, Dave, you've got to come over, you've got to see this game. So I go over, and he's got Zaxxon going. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is a two-player alternate play game. So you fly your fighter plane till the space fighter plane till it crashes, and then I get to fly mine until I crash, right? And it keeps track of our respective scores. And you get like five planes each, right? Or you get to try five times each. Well, he hands me the controller, so I go, maximum difficulty, two player combination, bap, bap, with the Oh, you bumped it. Well, you're probably not gonna last long at that difficulty level, but okay, let me show you how this works, right? Mm -hmm. And I have picked up the proper controller, so I'm going first. Mm -hmm. And he goes, nothing's on his controller. I got the other one, right? He says, and the sound effect starts, and this, you're flying towards a space asteroid, and there's this big wall, and the players used to have a real problem with not realizing that there's one gap in the wall, and you've got to line up with it quick before you smash into the wall, mm -hmm. or the game's over right there, right? So I flip my plane over, I go through the hole, and he says, boy, we're lucky on that one. <laughs> and then I just I methodically demolish every target. All the way down, I get off the end of the first asteroid, I shoot down a bunch of the attacking fighter planes, I go into the second asteroid, I'm finally confronted by Zaxxon, the giant robot, and I shoot him right in the missile that he carries under his arm, it blows up and utterly destroys him, and then I fly on to the next asteroid where I crash. And Mike is standing with his mouth open, he said, I guess you've seen this game already, huh? <laughs> Thousands of hours of working on that game, thank you. You had no idea. No idea. It was, it was fun. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week. Got some more stuff uh, from uh, David coming up, including some great stuff about the Coleco Adam <laughs> debacle or what might have been, uh, <laughs> had things gone another way. Uh, anyway, really interesting stuff, so stay tuned for that. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you for your support of this show. You are making these episodes possible. Couldn't do it without you. Really, really appreciate your help. Uh, if you would like to help and haven't done so already, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. You can become a, a Matt Chat Rat and uh, help keep the show going. Only ask a dollar per episode, you know. Uh, hopefully you can afford that. Uh, but if you can or if you just don't want, you want to help out the show another way, uh, lots of ways to do that too. You can just uh, tell people about the show, post about it on Facebook, Twitter, all those good things. And uh, whatever you do, if you're helping me out, I appreciate it and thank you. All right, uh, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, so first bit of news here. This is again from old, our old friend Stig about our old friend David Gilbert. Uh, you might remember uh, I interviewed him not so long ago uh, of Wadget Eye Games. Uh, he's coming out with what they're calling an urban fantasy adventure game called Unavowed. And uh, this one will have some RPG elements in there as well. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the story of the game and then I'll tell you about those uh, elements. And so for six months you were possessed by a demon uh, for six months, you unwillingly tore a trail of bloodshed through New York City. Now, finally, you are rescued by the une Unavowed, an ancient society dedicated to stopping evil. You are free, but your world is in tatters. You have no home, no friends, 
and you were wanted by the police. That kind of sounds like me. Uh, you cannot return to your old life, but perhaps you can start a new one. Join the unavowed and learn to fight against the oncoming darkness. Uh, so as, uh, the uh, RPG stuff is apparently inspired by Bioware games. Here's a quote from uh, uh, David on this. He says, uh, my favorite part of the Bioware game, uh, games are whenever I finish a section I love and seeing how the various companions you choose react to things. This is basically a whole game based on that. Uh, so this sounds a really, really uh, incredible, actually. I think he's, he said somewhere that he's having to do every puzzle five times. It kind of almost sounds a little bit like uh, a quest of glory, uh, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know what he, he says. He's uh, more inspired by Bioware. I just wanted to go check that out. I'll try to keep you posted as we hear more about this game, but uh, thanks to Steg for sending this uh, to me. Uh, and then something I found uh, on Steam Greenlight. They've, there's a game up there called The Caribbean Sail. And this is a retro-style nautical game inspired by a classic. It's uh, obviously Oregon Trail inspired. Uh, sail across the Atlantic Ocean from London to Nassau and face real dangers of sailing in the 1700s. So I guess instead of a dysentery, you get scurvy in this game. Uh, anyway, it's got a great look to it, great music, and it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'll post a link to that on the Steam Greenlight. And then a final bit of news, uh, StarCraft Remaster has been unveiled. This is a, an HD version. It's designed to scale for 4K resolutions and widescreen, uh, so that's exciting. And they're also releasing the SD version as free, uh, free as in beer. Uh, so that's kind of exciting. I, I'm not sure how many people are still playing that. I know it was huge. Uh, what was it? In, in Korea, I think. It was basically their <laughs> an e-sport. Uh, so I wonder how how they uh, making it free, if that'll make a, a comeback, you know, we'll see. Uh, anyway, uh, that, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, now, before we go on to the L segment, though, I got a, an unboxing video here. Uh, Robbie, a longtime fan of the show, friend of the show, I guess I should say, has uh, sent uh, a box. <laughs> so there's all kinds of goodies in here, so I thought it'd be fun to uh, uh, open this as part of the uh, the show, let me grab my handy razor here. I guess I could use my, my Rambo knife, but I don't want to get tape gunk all over it, right? All right, let's see what Robbie has sent over. There is a sort of a biohazard label on it. I don't know if that's a joke. <laughs> now, let's see if I can do this without cutting myself open. All right. Let's see what Robbie has sent over. Okay, yeah, this is my favorite. I, I love, I love this. I've always wanted some of my own bubble wrap. Uh, <laughs> All right, what do we have? Fantasy Five, five games in one package. Oh wow, this has got a, a King's Quest, Romancing the Throne, the Magic Candle Three. I've been wanting to do uh, to do that Magic Candle series for some time. Uh, we've got uh, the Summoning here. Uh, an SSI game, looks like. Uh, Might Magic 3 and uh, Populous. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting uh, combination of games. I uh, haven't seen that collection before. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, wow, he really did a good job with the, the packing. What is what is that? It's like uh, straw. Uh, I wonder if he, uh, Robbie lives on a farm. <laughs> okay, let me get this what else is here? Ooh, what's this? It's a uh, rat on a stick. What? <laughs> what is this? Uh, by George R. Paxult, Judges Guild. Uh, approved for use with tunnels and trolls. Wow. Wow, what is this? I guess it's a, what is it, like a campaign guy? Or... This is like triple wrapped. Is this? How do I get it open? Oh no! I guess it's uh, sealed in here. All right, I'm gonna have to try not to damage it, but I'm kind of, uh, you know, I got to see what the rat on the stick is like. Let's see. I guess I'm gonna have to take out the knife here. I have to be really careful not to uh, rip this thing. All right. There we go. 
rat on a stick that really sounds <laughs> that's got my attention you know what can i say all right there we go Whew. thought it were getting this open okay so it's a this book belongs to well so it is i guess it's a uh an rpg uh like a tabletop guy oh it's got maps in here yeah this must be a, a campaign right or a module yeah, I haven't played a whole lot of uh, tabletop D&D. &D. I'm more of a computer role-playing game guy, but yeah, that's what this is, all right. Wow. You know, I had never seen this before. A rat on a stick. Got some nice uh, artwork in here. Really looking forward to the, uh, reading this. All right, thank you, Robbie. Let's see, I guess I could put this back in here to keep it from getting all yellowy. Kind of like comic books, you know. Have to find some friends. Kind of like that guy in Unavowed, you know. Okay, what do we have here? Wizard's Crown. Whoa, Wizard's Crown. <laughs> wow, this is, uh, you know, this is the game that they based a lot of the uh, combat in a Pool of Radiance on. You know, if you remember, of course, you know that game. Uh, so this was kind of, in a lot of ways, the progenitor of that. Uh, SSI, of course, Commodore 64, 128. Well, it's, it's in really good shape, too. Uh, this is a uh, love the the artwork on this. Yeah, this is going to have to go on the uh, the shelf here somewhere. Definitely a worthy classic. Put it right there for now. Oh, what do we have here? Conan Sumerian. Wow. Now it's got some lovely art on this. What system is it for? <laughs> Tandy. <laughs> Remember them. Now, IBM, Tandy, and MS-DOS compatible as well. Always been a big fan of Conan. And here's the Conan the Sumerian game. Really lovely box art on that. You know, I was just so sad that we don't have these, this great box art anymore. You might have uh, tucked that in there. <laughs> oh, and what else do we have? Got a role-playing games. Okay, so there's some... I guess he's put some games uh, for me on this thumb drive. I guess we, you know, we used to just have the little hand, handwritten labels on the discs, right? All right, I think that's, I think that's all. I can uh, feed this to the horses later. That'll be nice. <laughs> anyway, thanks, uh, Robbie, so much for all this stuff. Gonna have a lot of fun with that. And I'm gonna see if I can find somebody to play rat on a stick with. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a Tin Whiskers Brewing Company uh, American Wheat Ale. This is the Wheat Stone Bridge. It's a, let's see, <laughs> uh, they got a lot of details about it here. Let's see, it says, a, it says it tastes earthy with apples and floral sweetness. <laughs> Light body silky mouthfeel. <laughs> almost getting a little, uh, a little uh, professional, I guess, with the, the beer tasting. Uh, a crisp and refreshing American-style wheat beer with distinct flavors of honey and chamomile tea. Refrigerate for freshness. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I can just barely make it out there. Alcohol, 5.4%. So, you know, it's about average, I would, I guess. Uh, anyway, it's been a while since I've had a really good wheat ale. And this one's brewed right here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, so I thought I'd give this a try, the uh, Tin Whiskers. Uh, so anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Tin Whiskers here in the rather excellent drinking horn, American Wheat Ale. You know, I think I've, uh, you know, of course, had lots of Blue Moons. Is that one considered an American Wheat Ale? Or I wonder if it's a style of Wheat Ale or just to, happens to be where it's from. Uh, not really sure. Ah, definitely smells nice and weedy. You know, I always thought uh, uh, wheat ales kind of smell uh, very citrusy. <sighs> kind of like, kind of reminds me of pears uh, with a little bit of uh, like orange zest, a sort of aroma. It's just a really pleasant uh, smell on this. And you know, I, I've said this before, but you know, if all you've ever had is like the standard uh, Budweiser's and, and things of that sort, uh, and if you don't like those, or you want something really different, go for these wheat ales. Uh, they definitely taste a lot different than the. Uh, standard uh, beers. Anyway, uh, this smells really good, so let's give it a taste. Hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm glad that they had mentioned that uh, chamomile tea on the, uh, the can there, because I'm not sure I would have picked up on that or known what to call that, but uh, I'm definitely tasting that, uh, probably more so than even the uh, sort of citrusy flavors that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that you get with a wheat. Now let me try it again here. Yeah, this is a pretty unusual tasting wheat. Uh, it's definitely a little bit on the uh, lighter side. You get that sort of chamomile flavor. Uh, they mentioned honey. I'm not really tasting uh, much honey here. Uh, a little bit of a, I guess, a wheat flavor with a lot of uh, that chamomile flavor. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm not really liking this one too much. Uh, it's a little, a little on the watery side for my taste. There's just not a whole lot of flavor there. Uh, smells good, and I guess if you really want a, a chamomile taste in your wheat, uh, this would be a good option. But, uh, you know, just not really liking this all that much. Uh, I guess I'm going to go maybe a 2 out of 5 uh, drinking horns on it. Uh, you can definitely find some uh, better wheat ales than this. I'd probably even go for, a, uh, say, a hoe garden before I uh, do this one. Uh, so 2 out of 5 drinking horns, it's not terrible, it's not awful, just uh, uh, not all that great. So uh, 2 out of 5. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quotation. And uh, uh, this, is not, this is a little bit long, I guess, for this segment, but I've been reading this uh, book here, The Book of Virtues. <laughs> thought it had something to do with Ultima when I saw it on the bookshelf. But uh, anyway, it's just a bunch of stories and poems and all, all sorts of stuff about uh, the virtues, right? I guess it's for use uh, with kids. Uh, but then there was a, a story in here that I just thought was really good. It's uh, about the uh, explorer Ernest Shackleton. Who you might know he did some uh, explorations in the Antarctic and he to recruit people to go on this uh, voyage uh, he posted a, an article or an ad a classified ad a newspaper and uh, the ad is incredible so I'll read that to you <laughs> and then you can be thinking about whether you would respond to an ad like this uh, this is how it goes something like this men wanted for hazardous journey small wages bitter cold Long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. Ernest Shackleton. So apparently, and this is a later quote from a Shackleton, uh, it said, it seemed as though all the men in Great Britain were determined to accompany me. The response was so overwhelming. Now, I think there's definitely a lesson in there for us. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this, and see you guys next week. Let's see if his magic is as good as he says. Hulu Fatal!